Welcome back to our study of the book of Philippians. We're looking this week at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5, just one, word, uh, one verse again this week. And uh, that verse says this, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. So two concepts there. The first, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. What does that mean? And number two, the Lord is at hand. That could mean a couple different things as well. So first, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. What does Paul mean by that? Well, the word that's uh, rendered reasonableness in my translation, you might find a different word in your translation, maybe something like gentleness. Um, it's a word, gentleness is actually a really good translation. Reasonableness is not a bad translation. Uh, it means reasonableness in this sense. If we uh, saw someone who was in a position where they could have been really upset about something, they could have been justifiably angry perhaps or, or something like that, and we said, you know, they weren't angry, they were actually really reasonable. Uh, that's something like what Paul uh, means here. Let your reasonableness, let your gentleness be known to everyone. Uh, gentleness here, uh, another word that we have to kind of explain and remind ourselves what it means in biblical terms. Sometimes we think of gentleness, um, we think of weakness um, or something along those lines, um, but we used to use the word gentleman right, to mean someone who was uh, strong and self-controlled and kind and gracious, at least in theory, um, to the people around. That's what a, how a gentleman acted, somebody who was reasonable, right? So these words can go together. Uh, so Paul is saying, you Christians there at Philippi, and of course by extension to us uh, who are believers today, you Christians should be reasonable, should be gentle. You should be the kind of people who extend grace and kindness to others. Uh, you should be the kind of people that um, in some ways act differently than sort of the mainstream of the culture around you. That would have been true in Paul's day, just as it's true in our day, if somebody's reasonable and gentle. Um, not saying there aren't any non-Christians who act that way, but just the, the mainstreams of the culture that's not uh, normal, right? That's not dominant um, for people to be gentle and reasonable. So um, Paul says, let, first of all, you should act that way. That's the kind of person you should be uh, because that's how Christ was. But second of all, let people see that. Let people see that you are reasonable people. Let people see that you are gentle, gracious, kind people. Uh, non, the non-Christians around you, they need to see that in you. They need to see you treating them, them that way. They need to see you treating uh, other Christians that way, other non-Christians that way. This should be something that everybody notices about you as an individual and you as a church. So sometimes we think that what non-Christians need to see is uh, you know, believers making slam dunk apologetic arguments or talking about theology with the same brash tone as many of the political talking heads on uh, you know, news radio or news media or whatever um, often do that we're gonna you know, show that we have the same toughness and, and whatever. No. That's not what the non-Christian world needs to see. What the non-Christian world needs to see is Christians exercising grace. They need to see us speaking with people and engaging with people who disagree with us and yet doing it with kindness and with respect and with gentleness. They need to see something different in us than what they're seeing in the rest of the world. They need to see us respond like Jesus to people who disagree with us. And... Um, that's something that um, can be a challenge for us, right? It can be a challenge for us in the way that we interact with people on social media, whether it's you know uh, the various different platforms that you may be involved in. Um, same thing when we're you know having a meal with family members that we disagree with, maybe. 
uh, or whatever it may be, that people need to see Christians, and we're not going to do this perfectly, right? but they need to see Christians showing uh, respect, speaking with gentleness, with reasonableness, uh, even towards those who don't hold our same views on a, on a number of matters. Right? So that's, that's the first thing Paul calls us to in these verses. The second thing is he reminds us that the Lord is at hand. Now this could mean two different things. It could mean remember that the Lord is always near, or it could mean remember that the Lord is coming soon. So he will be here soon. His, his return is near. Um, either one of those is possible, so let's think about both of them. Uh, what if it means Jesus is, the Lord is near to us right now? Why would Paul say that here? Why would he remind us that the Lord is near now? This is, of course, something that the Bible makes very clear is true. God is omnipresent, we say, so he's everywhere at once. Uh, there's no place where we can go where God's not there. Uh, Psalm 139 is the classic text on that truth. Psalm 139, verse 7 through 12 says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. So the Lord is everywhere. There's nowhere we can go to flee from him. Right? Jonah uh, learned that lesson or was reminded of that lesson when he tried to flee from the Lord, when the Lord called him to go to Nineveh. He got on a boat going the other way, and God found him, and God... Um, came after him, right? And Jonah ended up doing what God wanted him to do. But we can't, um, we can't get away from God. And as Christians, at least most of the time, we don't want to get away from God. So we may have some Jonah moments, um, but by and large, we want to be near to the Lord. We want to be reminded that he is near to us. The Bible is very clear that he'll never leave us or forsake us. Right? Um, he is always present with us. Jesus promised his disciples and promised us in Matthew 28 that um, he said, you know, he said, go therefore make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, um, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you till the end of the age. Right? And Jesus told his disciples he would send the Holy Spirit to be with them who dwells in us. So, um, he is near to us now, all the time, every day, everywhere we go, he is near to us. And um, perhaps Paul mentions this here as he encourages us to treat others with gentleness and respect, to let our reasonableness be known to everyone. Perhaps he says this here to say, and remember... The Lord is near you, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever conversation you're having, whatever interaction you may be having with another person, the Lord is near. So be mindful of his presence. Uh, some call this living uh, quorum Deo, which is a phrase that means something like uh, before the face of God. Remember that you are always in God's presence, in a sense, that you are always uh, before the eyes of God and you seek to live your whole life aware of the fact that all of your life is meant to be lived to the glory of God, is meant to be an act of worship to God as you imitate Christ in your life, as you live by the Spirit, as you manifest the fruit of the Spirit, uh, that we are always to be living uh, mindful of the Lord. All right? So that's that could be what Paul means. Um, maybe a little more likely, though, Again, it's really hard to decide between these two. Maybe a little more likely is that Paul is saying, remember that the Lord is near, meaning his coming is near. He's coming soon. Uh, much of the New Testament emphasizes this. We see it emphasized, especially in the book of Revelation. Uh, but all throughout the New Testament, there is this emphasis on the nearness of the return of Christ, that he could come soon. He could come, um, you know, essentially at any time. Um, and that we should live as people who are 
ready for his return. Jesus taught that, and the disciples, uh, the apostles, teach us to live that way as well. For example, Hebrews 10.25 uh, tells us to um, encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. That would be the day of Christ's return. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. The end of all things is at hand. The end is near. Romans 13, 11, and 12 says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. So again, the, the reminder that the, the day of the Lord is near, the fullness of our salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Uh, the day is at hand, right? Night is far gone, day is at hand. And then there's this emphasis on that ought to shape the way that we live. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Um, so that may be what Paul is, is doing here as well. He's saying, hey, look, you need to let your reasonableness be known to everyone. And in your conversations with uh, people outside of the church, you need to make sure that you are speaking with them and dealing with them in a Christ-like manner, with gentleness, with respect, with kindness, with grace, grace, graciousness, all the rest. And do that reminding yourself that the day of the Lord's return is near, and that means the day of you giving an account to the Lord for all that you've done is also near. Remember, Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, I believe it's verse 9 and 10, that um, we all have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and uh, we're all going to have to give an account to him for what we've done. Um, and so we want to be living faithfully now so that we can give a good account right, of our lives. And so maybe that's what Paul is saying. And if that's the case then what Paul is saying very briefly here in just one verse and, and really not very many words is something that James seems to expand on in James, excuse me, James chapter 5, verses 7 and 9. He says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So again, that emphasis on the Lord is coming soon, and that ought to affect the way that we live right now. That ought to encourage us to treat others, in this case, um, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, treat others in the way that we will uh, in a way that we will not be ashamed to uh, admit to before the Lord when he returns. So the point of all this, right, is that we should be living in light of the return of Christ, and that means living our life mindful of Christ and in a way that will bring honor to Christ. So to, to kind of help you get a, an idea of how this might feel practically, think about how you would feel if... Uh, one day this week, uh, someone from your church called you up and said, um, hey, we would like you to say the opening prayer uh, during our, our worship service this Sunday morning. How would that affect the rest of your week? If you're thinking, okay, on Sunday, I've got to lead in prayer first thing. How would that affect your morning at home? That Sunday morning? How, how would that affect your drive to church? Would you be more or less likely to read your Bible and pray that morning before you go to church? Would you be more or less likely to apologize to your spouse or to your kids for being impatient and grumpy or whatever that morning before you get to church? Right? Would you be more or less likely to be gracious to those who greet you as you come into church. Well, I mean, wouldn't that change your perspective? Wouldn't you be more mindful of wanting to um, keep your heart right before the Lord and be treating others appropriately before you come before the Lord in prayer publicly before a lot of other people? I mean, I think probably for most of us, right, those, those things or something like those things would be uh, more on our minds and hearts than, than normal, right? 
And so sort of on a bigger scale, that's kind of, that's what Paul is saying, right? Be thinking all the time about the fact that either, both are true, either you're always living in the presence of the Lord, right? Or that the Lord is coming soon and you're going to have to give an account to him. And so be thinking now about how you're living uh, in light of his nearness, whether that's his constant nearness or whether that's the nearness of his coming. In other words, Paul wants us to think about the way we live from day to day, the way we interact with people, and how that should be shaped by the thought of the nearness of Christ. Right? So how should this change you? How should this verse and these truths shape the way that you interact with people this week? Do you want to go another day indulging your pride? Right? Being rude on the road or in line at the store? Or acting like a jerk toward people that you don't like? Or do you want to be reasonable and gentle and gracious like Jesus was? Not, not in a weak way, but in a kind of um, strong kindness, if I can say it that way. A, a gentle strength. Right? Whatever sins you struggle with in your interactions with other people, and it may not be pride, and it may not be rudeness, it may be something else, but whatever it is, right, whatever, um, however you're tempted to be not reasonable, right, however you're tempted to be not gentle, not kind, remember that you are living in the presence of the Lord all the time, and remember that Jesus is coming soon, and the Bible says that we're going to give an account for every word that we speak. And remember that not so that you'll feel guilty all the time about all the ways that you fail, right? But that, remember that in such a way that it'll spur you on to seek to be and ask the Lord to help you be more Christ-like in the ways that you speak and act toward those around you. We all fail. Right? But the Lord gives grace. His mercies are new every morning. If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And He's given us His Word to encourage and strengthen us and His Spirit to empower us to live more like Jesus. Let's pray that He helps us to do that even today. Amen.